if your decision is whatever it is, I want to help. I want to support the ministry of Village Baptist Church in the year 2011. Thank you, media man. <laughs> All right. Here comes the quiz. What does the word ministry mean? What does the word ministry mean? I'm looking for hands to go up. Serving and helping. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? You want something? Yes. Say that again. Bring him forth. To bring forth the word. What how is that different from preaching? No, she said helping and serving. <laughs> yes. You said bringing forth the word, which is preaching, right? Oh, okay. that, that's, that's what you said, right? Uh -huh. So you agree that's the meaning of bringing forth the word is preaching or teaching the word? Yeah. Okay. Teaching religion? Okay. Yes. Carry out the work of the body of Christ. Okay. You're very good. Okay. In order to be in ministry, what do you have to be? Okay. You guys are very strong on that one. There's no doubt at all. You have to be saved. Okay, I'm learning something this morning. So in order to be in ministry, you have to be saved. Who is a minister? Are you sure? Okay, I think I taught you wrong. If I said that I was wrong. Can someone tell me why I'm wrong? <laughs> okay, let me redefine that. So next time I ask you, who is a minister, don't say all of us. If I say, who should be a minister, then you can say all of us. Okay, who is a minister? A minister is one who serves. Okay? You can't say I'm a minister because I'm a Christian. If you're not serving, you're not a minister. Are we together? Okay. You're doing well in the quiz. Now, if you look through the whole Bible, if you look at Genesis all through Revelation, where can you find in the Bible passages dealing with ministers and ministry? Okay. What? Leviticus, Matthew 28, James. Pretty soon somebody's going to say the whole Bible. <laughs> Okay, I want you to be pinpoint specific. First Peter, thank you. Chapter what? Chapter 2, verse what? 8 through 10, correct. All right. Okay, now there is another passage though. That is, that is very, yes. Okay. 
I think if you're trying to talk about Dickens and Dickens ministry, you can use that passage. Okay. Uh, any other passage about ministry and ministers? First Peter, don't forget First Peter. Okay. Put that down. First Peter. Okay. Some of you did uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the gifts with me, and uh, you probably you're having uh, you you're forgetting something now, right? Okay. Okay. When we get to scripture specific, uh, you kind of shaky in the quiz. First Corinthians chapter what? Chapter twelve. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter twelve. If Thank you. Ephesians chapter what? Four. All right. Okay, we're done with the quiz now. Okay. All right. So let's look at supporting the ministry in 2011. Could you turn to the book of Nehemiah? Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Okay. Nehemiah, right after Ezra. We're going to look at chapter 4, and we're going to look at chapter 6, and then I will direct you to other scripture passages. Okay. Yes. That's correct. No, no. If you're not, if you're not ministering, representing God, anytime you said I'm a minister, you're representing God. So if you're representing something else, then you're not a minister. You are a false minister. You know, you're serving, but you're serving falsely. That's probably a good sign for you to run away from them. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. Please pay attention to this. I want to tell you the four things. The first thing. The first thing is from Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. What is the first thing that you must be committed to? What is the first thing that you must do in the year 2011 if you want to be a true minister for God? Not a false minister, but a true minister for God. What does it say? Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. So we built the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people did what? Work with what? All their hearts. So if you want to work for God in 2011, you must do it with all of your heart. Amen? You can't do it half-heartedly. You cannot do it with one foot in and one foot out. It's not going to work. <laughs> Thank you. You're helping me with my message today. Praise the Lord. Okay. You cannot do it like that. You cannot be with God and be with the devil. At the same time, Jesus said, you cannot serve good ma two masters. You will either be committed to one or get on and go with whatever you want to be. But you must be committed. If you want to serve God in the year 2011, your whole heart must be committed to God. If your heart is in it, you will find a way to do it. 
If your heart is in it, you will find a way to do it. Nehemiah is very clear. When they were building the wall, when they were doing it, it wasn't that they were all skilled. It wasn't that they knew everything. But the one thing they did was their heart was in it. Everybody that stood on that wall wanted the wall to be completed. If you want the work of God to go on in 2011, if you want the youth ministry to expand in 2011, if you want the men's ministry to be effective in 2011, if you want the women's ministry to be effective in 2011, if you want the food ministry to be effective in 2011, if you want the media ministry to be effective in 2011, you must put your heart into it. Amen. You can't go to one men's ministry meeting and then the next one, you cannot be found. In the world, they say that called jiving. <laughs> Amen. You don't commit it to nobody. Do it with your utmost, not half hearted. Though you will not, you will never be successful if you're not committed to it. You can never be a good student if you don't go to class every day. Amen. You go to class once a week and you want an A. And I'm not telling you that, I'm not joking. I've, I've been a seminary teacher. A teacher, and most of my students were pastors. Some of them come in any time they want, and they don't know I'm taking notes. And at the end of the semester, uh, I did I did a work on this. I did this and this. Why you give me C? I said because you're not committed. Trucking and jiving, you know. <laughs> you know they just you know they want they want the best in the world but they just think it happens it doesn't just happen you have to put your heart into it when you see that a student when you were do, dancing and boogieing and doing all this they were at home studying hey. it doesn't happen just because you wish it right dj you don't get that A in geometry and algebra because God loves you. <laughs> Amen. Because you put some work into it. If you don't understand it, you go to somebody else who understands it. You say, please, Jonathan, teach me how to do this. You got to put your heart into it. Some of us, we just, we just want to come in here and see everything ready. Why don't they have lights today? Why don't they have this? Why don't they have that? Because you're half-hearted. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. I'm looking at that time. You see, sometimes time is so funny. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. I want one scholar to read it for me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Amen. Isn't it interesting that America is blessed. The richest country in the world. I mean, regardless of all the debt America has, America is still the richest country in the world. In 1910, 
the total murder rate in America, only 230 people were killed in 1910. Today, Richmond alone has that. Why, why, are we, why are we so rich and so affluent? You have cars. Some of you, somebody just got out and gave you a car. How many countries can you have someone just get up and say, hey, I have a car, get it. I have a car for you too. The Lord has a car for you. <laughs> Your wife says she'll take it. <laughs> but you see, this is the point. We have all this, thing, but then we're shooting each other. America is not happy. America is rich, but America is poor. Because our heart is in the wrong place. You got to commit your heart to God. Do you know what being committed means? This you there. Some of us just want to do it only when it's convenient. Uh, hello, Pastor. I can't come to church today. <coughs> uh, what's happening? I thought you were going to say I have a cold. No, I have a headache. Same person will have a headache on Monday and go to, go to work. I heard it's in the wrong place. The reason why the people were able to build the wall is because they have all their heart in it. You cannot be in ministry for God and your whole heart is not committed to God and you're not wanting to do his will. You don't like what he likes. You don't hate what he hates. You can do ministry for him. Some of us serve God as a spare tire. The only time I need him is when I'm in trouble. The heart is the center of things that matter to you. If, you, if you're committed to God, you will be committed to him first. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. He said, not only did they give out of what they didn't have, but the one thing we're happy about is that they committed themselves first to God. I have to tell you, some of us think we're Christians or we're members of the church when we're not. Because we have, if, if you have never committed yourself to Jesus, how can you commit yourself to Village Baptist? Village Baptist cannot be in existence without God. Right, Thomas? He took a trip to Florida because he wanted to better his life. He's looking for a place where he can complete his college education, where he can make things work because he wanted it to happen. We need to put a lot into God. God is not just somebody you think about on Sunday. Somebody owes twenty dollars. <laughs> yes. On this, praise the Lord. God answers. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll allow we'll allow that. <laughs> okay. The second point is this. Let's look at Nehemiah. You know, I have not read every scripture I have. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, with all your heart, with all your might. You've got to put your heart into it. 
If you want, if you want the other scriptures, I, I have my notes for you. I have enough for anyone that wants it. You know, but it's really important we understand this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24 pointed it out again. You got to do it. You got to do it. If you want to work for God, you can't be just fooling yourself. You can't be fooling yourself. God wants the whole of you. Not just your hand. He wants everything. Number two. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 15. If we are going to do God's work, this is what's got to happen. Verse 15. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Did you get it? When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. If our ministry in Village Baptist Church is going to be successful in 2011, all of us, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have accepted him and you said, I want to be part of this body of believers, you have to do your work. Stop calling yourself a minister when all you do is just sit down. Amen, lights. Michael Jordan is one of the best players in the NBA ever. He never won one game by himself. Many of you know that our son Joshua is playing professional basketball in China. He scored 36 points today. And they, they went back to their winning ways. They're now 11 and 1. Okay. <laughs> they call him the little foreign aid. <laughs> but the one thing is that last time when they lost their first game the coach got the two best players to sit out the fourth quarter and they asked him why we can still come back he said no I don't want you guys to be hurt So he just gave up the game. They can't win without everybody putting it together. You are not going to be able to do the work that God has given to me. I will not be able to do the work that God has given to you. Each one of us have to do the things that God has called us to do in order for this work to be successful and the ministry to go forward in the year 2011. Listen. It takes a team to win a game. I'm signing like Edwards now. Hello? <laughs> it takes a team you have to play you wouldn't know it but I was a goalie in high school and I was so good I was chosen by the whole western Nigeria to represent the high school team but I can tell you that as a goalie, you know, or at least you think everything depends on you. When they win the game, they say you're a good goalie. When they lose, you better not lose in Nigeria. 
Sometimes before you get home, your house is burnt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I wish I knew this principle then and I could tell them every time we lost. I'm not the team. Every time we win, I can take it. <laughs> it takes a team to win and the church is a team. If I, the, the word that the Bible uses is we are the body of Christ. The body consists of many parts. And all the parts have to do their work in order for you to function well as a body. Your nose cannot go on strike. <laughs> You'll be dead. Well, you can open your mouth and breathe through your mouth. Just pray your mouth doesn't go on strike. And there are even some things you can't see. But they're constantly working. Sometimes if you think too much about the body, you can go crazy. Just enjoy the Lord. <laughs> Say, they're working. I'm fine. <laughs> it's a body. It's a team. We all have to commit to it. The, Nehemiah said, everybody that committed to it, we all stood on that wall. God wants you to stay on the wall for the ministry of Village Baptist Church in 2011. And just in case you think it cannot be done without me, I'll take you to the next point. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16. Again, I, I'm sorry I can't give you all the scriptures today. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 16. In fact, let me go back to verse 15. I'm going to read 15 and 16. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elah. In 52 days, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. If we want great results in 2011, you have to forget that you're the one doing it. You have to realize that nothing can be done without God. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, it is that does what? Bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Absolutely zero. Nada. Without God, you cannot do anything. I want to read a story to you. I think I have some time to do that before I go to my next point. Judges chapter 7. Early in the morning, Jerubael, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Mori. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. You know that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. You know how many people left? So 22,000 men left. While 10,000 remained. Okay, let's say roughly they have about 35,000. The majority of them left. 
But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many. There are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will sift them for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. Did you see the picture? How many were still left? No, 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 before the 300. 10,000. Can you just see? Immediately, 9,700 people all of a sudden got on their knees to drink. Lazy people. Gideon said, uh, God said, Gideon, send them home. I don't want them. Now, at this point, Gideon is beginning to think. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, do you want to think this over again? Uh, even when America was fighting Iraq, little Iraq, they needed more than 60,000 soldiers. I came here with about 30,000 soldiers. You sent 20,000 of them home already. And I have 10. I still think I can do something with them. Now you're telling me to send away 9,700 of them. You don't need them. What kind of a general are you? What kind of an assault are you planning? You're going to fight all this. It was not just the Midianites alone. You're going to fight all these people with 300 men? Just because they couldn't, they're drinking water like this? Yes. And the only reason why I want to do it that way is because I want you to know that I'm winning this one. I'm winning this one. I'm doing it. And, and it's really interesting. Not only, you know, and then Gideon, Gideon said, I'm kind of paraphrasing right now. Gideon said, hmm, okay, Lord. But God saw it. God said, you know what, just in case you want to be sure that I mean what I'm saying, I want you to take your servant. I want your servant to go with you to the camp. Don't let them see you, but listen to what they're saying. And then you'll be convinced that I have this taken care of. And they went there, and, and one of them said, I had a dream. And Gideon, he was listening. He said, I had a dream. I had a dream that a, a kind of loaf of bread came, big one, came to our camp and crushed everybody. And I didn't know what was happening. The other one said, oh, my Lord. You know what that means? That means God has given our people and they, he has placed us into the hand of that Gideon, the Israelite. He has given him the victory. Gideon said, really? God wanted him to hear that. And of course, you know, sometimes when God tells you something, after you've doubted a while, some of us act like we weren't doubting. You know, it, it's always interesting to hear people tell testimonies. I like testimonies, but I don't depend on testimonies. Because testimonies come out of a lot of failures. You know, a lot of us that testify today, we were the ones that were, not, that were doubting God before. But well, you see, God said, told uh, Gideon, I know you doubt it. It's okay. I know you doubt it, but go over there and see what I'm talking about. I'm not going to do it because you, I'm not going to stop doing it because you doubt me. I'm not going to stop blessing village because you're doubting what God can do. I'm not going to stop blessing you because you're doubting what I can do. I am God. I don't need you. I can do it whenever I want and however I want it. We sang that song and song this school. My God can do anything. He's got the power. He's got the power. My God can do anything. 
He made the rain right. He can do anything. He made the clouds. He can do anything. He made the thunder. He can do anything. In fact, he doesn't have to have a knife to, to operate on you to heal your body. He can do it. Right, Isam? One time you can feel something. The next time someone can come and pray in the power of God and it's gone. That's the God we serve. That's the mighty God we serve. He said, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it even when you doubt. I will do it. And the last point, I'll let you go. We must give beyond our abilities. If we want something to be done in the year 2011, don't give based on your faith. Give beyond your faith. Are you listening to me? Because many of us, our faith is limited to tithes. God said, no, no. At least turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 36. That's the second book in the Bible. Exodus 36. I'm going to start with verse 2. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offering morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord had commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more. Because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. Lord have mercy. Sometimes I have to sweat to get a dime. It'd be amazing to get to a place where you start bringing offering and we say, oh no, stop, stop, stop. We don't need any more. You understand what is happening here? If, you, if you're going to give to God, you must give generously, you must give sacrificially, you must give abundantly, you must give voluntarily. Don't go out, the pastor is trying to twist my hand. <laughs> Above all, like father, like son. Be like God. If you say you belong to him, be like him. God is a giver. Amen. I thank God he's a giver. With my knucklehead, he's still giving to me. He's not holding it against me. He's still giving to me. And God is not giving to me based on what I have done for him lately. He's giving to me because he is generous. Some people are, I don't know if I want to give to the church because this, because that. Keep your money. Because if you put it in there, it will contaminate the rest. <laughs> Keep your money. God wants only generous givers. God wants only voluntarily 
those who give voluntarily to him. God wants those who give to him generously without holding back. He said, give, and it shall do what? Come back to you. Oh, God is going to bless you. I know he's going to bless you. I know that because I know that I don't deserve what God has given to me. I have a daughter that is committed to Christ. I have a daughter that is working for Christ. I have a son that is working for God. I have one that God has blessed, and he is blessing him every time. And, and I say, Lord, what have we done? He says, it's not because of you. Hallelujah. I just want to bless. Oh, yeah. I just want to bless. And, and, and I said, Lord, you mean he doesn't have anything to do at all? I've been a good boy. <laughs> God said, no, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I see how you pray for them. I see how you trust me for their life. I see all that you do, and I just want to reward you. I want to tell you that I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing. Woo! Isn't God good? Amen. Hallelujah. God knows how to do things. I call my son. I say, you know, I would love to come watch your game. Even at least one. But village can't pay my way to come. <laughs> How am I going to do this? He said, don't worry. He said, I'll pay your way. Pay you and my mom to come. You're not going to watch only one game. you watch as many games you want. And uh, he went to his team. He told the owner, my parents are coming to visit in February. The owner said, uh, I'm paying their way. Amen. Amen. Now, now the manager of the team called me and said, the owner, you know, your son is a blessing. The owner wants to pay your way, and you're not even going to come here and coach. <laughs> Amen. I've, I've never been on a plane before where they serve you every minute you want something. <laughs> is it God good I don't deserve it but, but he's blessing he's blessing he's blessing you know everything is not going to come out in money you're looking for money oh Jesus thank God I can, I can run today I can run as fast as I used to. But I can still run because God is blessing me. God is showering his blessing upon me. If you just trust him in 2011, just put your faith in him. Just know that he can do it beyond what you think or ask. Oh, he'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. But don't come half-heartedly. Don't come with your food on the outside, your food on the inside, thinking you can, you can cheat God. He's omniscient. You can't cheat him. He's omnipresent. You can't cheat him. He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. You can't cheat him. Just trust him and know that he loves you more than you love yourself. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 